right? <laughs> you like that, don't you? He's my boy. Here, you want to you want to do I surrender for them? Come on, let's do I surrender. Do I surrender? Go ahead. That's I surrender. <laughs> so this is the entertainment portion of today's meeting. I'm grateful for it. Yeah. This is Dakin, if you didn't hear. So I guess since we're, um, we do have a quorum and uh, Valerie will be joining us, we can at least get started. And uh, let's see, let's call the meeting to order. Today is the 31st at 530. And this is the finance committee meeting. So um, is uh, what's on the agenda today is the education, um, the series 500, the human services, series 600, cultural and recreation, and possibly the fire department, which I'm not sure. Um, David, is that true? Fire department? Yeah, so we're still waiting for Chief Spanknable to uh, check in. So I'll send him a text message, but if you guys want to get going, that's fine. Okay, so we'll do that. Is there anybody on the meeting that is in, because I, otherwise I'll just go in order, that needs to do something quickly or needs to be out or is in a rush? No? Um, my Park and Rec commissioners are going to sign on uh, around 6, so whoever, 6.30, so whoever needs to go first, that's fine by me. Okay. I have a meeting at 7 that I'm going to get to um, if I can. Okay. So I have another uh, conference meeting. This is Annie. Um, so just want to let you know that if I'm finished by then, I'll, I'm going to leave the meeting. And I also wanted to let you know that if you guys are, are finished with me by then. Okay. Well, I guess we can get started with you since uh, you are. <laughs> we, we just pulled up your documents and you're here and all ready. So, okay. So I will uh, walk you through. Not, I'm not going to read everything in this document to you. Let me begin by saying thank you so much to all the members of the Finance Committee. Thank you for your service to the town. Thank you for um, allowing us to come before you and talk about our budget projections for FY21. I appreciate all that you do. What I have provided you with is our most recent update, um, our most recent projection for FY21. As I remind the Select Board and Finance Committee every single year, believe it or not, even right now at the end of March, there are still a number of unknowns. The process that we will go through, um, the school department, so the school committee received a projection from me and the business manager in February um, with what we knew at the time and what our best estimates were. We submitted that uh, local contribution request to Mr. Nixon. Mr. Nixon um, has a, a, an unenviable job of creating a balanced FY21 budget. He informed us that there was going to be, there had to be a reduction in that request right at the start, completely understandable. We went back to the drawing board and looked at what we could do. And, uh, and then I brought, we brought another estimate before the school committee last night. Um, please know that the public hearing for the budget, which is required by law, the school committee holds a separate public hearing for the school department budget, will happen the last Monday in April. The school committee knows that I'm here tonight with Chris Desjardins, our business manager for the schools, to walk you through where our projections are for FY21. And we also understand that the purpose of this conversation is for you all to ask questions, to then take this information, think about it, think about all of the town needs, and then communicate back to me um, through David or directly about what additional parameters or recommendations you would like the uh, school committee and the school department to follow. The bottom line in FY21 is we are looking at a total increase to expenses projected at this point of just over $250,000, about $257,000 in an expense in, in, in an increase in expenses and total expenses. That number, number never correlates exactly with uh, increases to local contribution, but that's what we're looking at in terms of in, increase in expenses. Of that, about 73% of that represents projected uh, increases in special education tuitions. 
And so I'm going to walk you through some of the assumptions that we have right now on the revenue side and also some of the assumptions we're working with on the expense side. So we are not assuming a significant change in circuit breaker, although we had initially hoped because with the new chapter 70 funding, funding formula, funding formula, excuse me, we had initially hoped that because some of special education transportation for out of district placements was going to be reimbursed, we would see an increase in circuit breaker reimbursement as it turns out, there are only certain out of district placements that are eligible for special ed transportation reimbursement. And of our special education placements, it's the minority of them that are eligible. Only at this point in time, four of those placements are eligible. So the new circuit breaker rules do not allow us to get special education transportation reimbursement for out of district places in other public school districts. So we have students who attend specialized programs in other public school districts or for collaborative programs, but only for private, what are called private 766 schools. So we maintain the amount of circuit breaker revenue. There is a slight increase in our Title I, Title IIA, and Title IV funding that we're anticipating. We anticipate our 240 grant, which is a grant that is a federal grant that passes through the state state pass-through grant for special education from IDEA. We anticipate that that will be the same. We are increasing the amount of funding from school choice that we will apply to the operating budget next year. We anticipate utilizing the same amount of pre-K or preschool revolving money. I mean, that could end up being a bit tight given the fact that we will not be collecting uh, all tuitions for the course of this year due to the closure. The 391 grant is a state grant that helps to support preschools. That grant, we have been told for a while that it was going to be eliminated. It is absolutely going to be eliminated next year. We tried to offset that by increasing the amount of school choice money that we are applying to the budget. So the increase, uh, we have a decrease in the amount of total non-local revenues that we're receiving just by over a couple of thousand dollars. And the increase to total revenues on the revenue side is about $257,000. So our expense projections reflect the following. Um, and you can see in the charts on the last two pages, you can see what are called function subtotals. So you can see changes in dollar amount and percent amount from FY20 and projected into FY21, the changes in each function subtotal. And the narration describes what ha what's happening in those function subtotals. So all central office admin assistants, central office staff, um, COLAs for those staff were approved in the summer of 2020. So that's the sharp increase you see from FY20 to projected in FY21. In FY20, we use the management solution where Chris works for our bookkeeping services. While we evaluated our needs back in FY19, we had a 1.0 full-time equivalent bookkeeper. We've decided in FY21 that we can get by with a 0.6. So we've reduced that position by 0.4. We have reallocated a position from elementary and secondary education services into district-wide academic leadership see a decrease on the elementary and secondary education uh, teaching instructional services, an increase in district-wide academic leadership. So that reallocation is explained that we have gradually reduced the teaching load of an English teacher so that that teacher can do more curriculum work at the district level. Um, as I said, the elementary and secondary teaching services reflect a decrease of 2.36 FTEs, full-time equivalents, did not replace a half-time math coach this year at uh, HES. Instead, we altered the schedule. And the art teacher, who is also certified in math, is providing that. So the service is still there. We just reallocated existing resources instead of hiring. And next year, our sixth grade will have two classes as opposed to three. So that will be a 1.0 decrease, uh, FTE decrease in general education teachers. And the reallocation I explained. We have had a decrease in the, we're projecting a decrease in the paraprofessional line, although that line can change very quickly because most often we are hiring 
educational support professionals or classroom assistants because of needs delineated in a student's individual education plan, and those are then federally mandated. In our initial budget proposal, in our initial budget proposal, we had uh, just over $28,000 that we were using as part of our professional development to support our, our school, our district strategy, which the school committee every summer goes on a retreat, and which means we come to my office and sit around my table. And it, at that time, they review their kind of five-year vision and their annual strategy. So there are some things that we have put as priorities. The short story on that is making sure that every student gets the behavioral and academic support that they need in order to meet grade level benchmarks. And so we've invested a lot in training teachers in the use of formative assessments, uh, doing data informed decision making, and implementing evidence based practices based on specific student needs. However, even though in that first and we still believe that we should be allocating resources in accordance with our vision document. We actually have now reallocated those resources to additional funds for custodial services and additional funds for food services. Our thinking on this is that um, we are assuming and planning for the potential for additional waves of COVID-19 in FY21. We hope that we don't see school closures like we did this year, but I believe it would be naive to think that there'll be no closures of any kind next year. Um, even if those are very short term, like DPH recommendations say, if you have a known case in a school, you shut down for two days and you disinfect. Sometimes they recommend longer periods of time and we have no way of knowing if the governor will recommend additional closures. So we do wanna be prepared to do regular disinfecting of our buildings next year, particularly in the event that there are additional cases in the second and third, uh, what they're referring to as cycles, anticipated cycles of COVID-19. We also know that we continue to feed children who are um, in need of meals, even when we're not in school. So we have added, uh, we have moved an expense directly into the operating budget. That's where some of this money went for FY21 uh, to support food services. Um, for the most part, uh, I'm gonna take you to again, the total projected increase increases to operating expenses, roughly $257,000, of which 73% or uh, roughly $188,000 represent increases in special education tuitions. What we don't know at this time for certain, which is why I say there are still some unknowns. So we know that we have two additional or new out of district tuitions that we are looking at for fiscal year 21. We just aren't certain where those placements will be. So we don't have exact tuitions at this point. In addition to that, we know that we have two students who will be changing placements, but we don't have signed IEPs as to where those placements will be. So the exact amount on that remains unknown. It could be less than the projection. Uh, hopefully it isn't more. And other things I've included for you, your FY21 cherry sheet estimates. Uh, Mr. Nixon shares these with you through um, the municipal, the cherry sheet, you all can go on there, the Department of DLS, Division of Local Services. So the FY21 cherry sheet estimate shows about $326,000 in school choice sending tuitions, so that's choice out. Um, they base that on what is right now. That's where they get that number from. I can tell you that we have four choice out tuitions who are seniors, so they will graduate if um, we didn't see an additional increase in choice out and our trends have been quite good now for the last two years. They are trending in the right direction and this year trended downward significantly for sending out tuitions. If those four students, we didn't see a replacement of four more students choicing out, 
then the actual choice out would be about $301,000. This, uh, uh, your cherry sheet indicates that your net charter aid, so charter aid, um, which is uh, your total receiving, um, oh shoot, your net charter aid. Net charter aid and, ch and charter tuitions is, sorry, is based on your October 1, 2019 count. So our actual count as of 124-2020, um, so they're looking at October 1 when they say what your charter tuitions are. Charter tuitions, net charter aid, excuse me, is that your actual tuitions, if you look at your cherry sheet, are just over $600,000. Um, or I take that actually closer to $700,000 because I think that your charter aid is estimated to be about $100,000 next year. So your net charter tuition, when I said net charter aid, your charter tuitions are total tuition minus charter aid. So they took account in 10-1 of 2019 and said, here are all the students that are sitting in charter schools from Hadley right now for which Hadley is fiscally responsible. I can tell you that that 10-1 count actually as of 124-2020 was less. So again, if we deduct the, the tuition rates for the four students who have returned to the district since 10-1, 2019, then charter tuitions in FY20 would be closer to $537,000. So total tuition expenses for FY21 net your charter aid equal, according to your cherry sheet, they're, they're thinking it's gonna be about $920,000. But based on what I just laid out for you, I would say that the projections would indicate total tuition expenses a little bit closer to $830,000 rounded at $838,000. So that's roughly $82,000 less than what you're seeing on your cherry sheet estimate. Again, um, those are, well, we'll have a definite charter number, assuming the charter uh, finance office is up and running and operating at full throttle. We'll have a definite number probably in about, I'm going to say end of April, early May. Chris, I don't know if you remember when they set the cutoff, but I think it's somewhere around there. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, I, I think it's May 1st. Okay, so that would mean that in May 2nd, we can say, no, this is, this is they can't charge any more than this, no matter what happens with charter enrollments. So um, that was a lot in, um, in a short bit of time. And what, how, what questions can we answer? What additional information can we provide to help you to then give us further direction? Not tonight, I know you have to think about these things, but <laughs> going forward. One of the things I wanted to ask you, um, and you mentioned it a little bit, um, you mentioned the pre-K, the cleaning, the food service. How has this virus impacted the schools for money? I know that you're still paying the teachers, but is there any money, one, um, it's costing maybe more money in certain areas, or is there other monies that is not costing, you're actually saving money because the school's not open? Yeah, so we hope, what we're hoping for, and this is uh, conservative op optimism, we're hoping for a wash. So you're correct, there are places, so for example, athletic field trips, not running those. Um, the buildings aren't running at the same degree of heat, although now we're going into spring, but we, could, we can keep the temperature lower. So there certainly are places where we will see some savings. But there again are also these other places where the income for preschool or for other programs just simply isn't, isn't there. We are tracking all the expenses associated with this, just like all of you are on the town side. So we're keeping very tight um, records of everything we spend and every revenue loss associated with this. And we will pay attention to what reimbursements are available. And even if those, uh, which I would assume, because I'm gonna assume that the reimbursements will be, will occur I don't know. I'm guessing they could occur after the close of the fiscal year. So really, we're trying to keep these very tight records so that the town can recoup that money on the town side and, and have that. We would turn those records over to the town so the town can put forth a claim. 
Um, are we still moving forward with the uh, the fields? You mentioned the fields. Are we still moving yes, forward? Yes, we are. So we, um, as of today, the Massachusetts, or last night, because Chris got the text first, but Chris Eric sent me something today, our athletic director. So as of last night, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association set out the schedule for spring because they're, they are assuming, Governor Baker has said, we resume classes on May 4th, correct? May 4th, yes, on Monday. Um, we res resume classes on May 4th. So we would have a very short season and, um, and then we will start the fields. We've awarded the bid. We will start the fields in the summertime. Um, we had considered if we would be able to start a little bit early, given the fact that um, we didn't know if we would have a spring season, but MIAA is saying, yes, we will. Now, of course that can change. So we are, uh, we have the funds, we've awarded the bid. We did make sure that there was a clause in the agreement that takes into consideration if everything goes awry again in the summer that we're not paying for work that isn't happening. Um, but yes, we are going to proceed. And the town will have a nice path to walk on at a socially distanced, in a socially distanced way, hopefully next year. Annie, I'm curious why the, um, the special ed tuition is going up. Why is it going up? So in this case, it takes into consideration uh, one brand new, no, excuse me, two brand new tuitions. So that means that they, at the team, so uh, students who have individual education plans, they have a plan that's designed by a team. So federal law says it's a team of people that includes the student's parent, representatives from the school, teachers, and other people parents can invite to be a part of that team that the team has determined that the least restrictive environment in which that student's needs can be met, in which that student can make effective academic progress uh, is a private or a non-public school. It's a very special kind of program. And often it can be a program that we don't have. So we do have, we do have a specialized special education program at the elementary school. We have that. We have special education support at the high school, but we don't have a separate specialized program. And I can tell you that even if we were to develop one at the high school, we would develop one that meets the needs of the students we currently have in the elementary school, so as to keep them in the district. Um, it is not cost effective to develop a highly specialized program for a single student um, to bring on staff for that, to do that, that's not cost effective. And also it would be a violation of a single student's right, or rights or even two students because they don't have, they don't have a peer group. So the other issue can be if a student has a disability, that is what we call low incidence. There are not a lot of folks with that disability. They have a low incidence disability. Not only do we have to have the programming to meet their needs, but they also need to have a peer group. They can't just be in a classroom by themselves all day long. Right. So in this case, we have two students, so two who need um, specialized programming. And sometimes it's just to give you an idea, the tuition at the May Institute. So the May Institute is an excellent program that serves students with autism. So just the tuition at the May Institute is now, uh, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is just about $120,000 for a student. That's just the tuition for one student. And then uh, busing, hold on, I gotta get my phone. Busing, if you look at um, transportation and you can assume that transportation conservatively that a bus can be uh, about $250 a day times um, 180 days, that's really conservative because often students get summer programming. So that would be an additional $45,000 for transportation. So if we have one student at the May Institute, it can conceivably cost for a single student $165,000 for tuition and transport. If they get additional services, it would be more. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if 
it were not for the requirement that they be in a, an area where there are peers. I'm just looking at the 168,000 and thinking a couple of, you know, a salary would fit in there very easily. And, but it's because of this rule that they need to have um, peers. Is that right? Is that well, and let me do a little more justice to that. It's not, I want to be careful. It's not a rule. It's part of the analysis that you have to do is what is the least restrictive environment? So we would say we would never want a situation if a student had needs where their programming was so scripted that they would almost end up being doing, let's say, doing a specialized kind of intervention, discrete trial by themselves with an adult in a room. We would say, yeah, that's, that's the team the team makes this decision would say, that really doesn't make sense. But I want you to know, Valerie, to your point, the reason we have this specialized program at the elementary school is because under Pat Bell, who's retired now, actually is interim superintendent in Mohawk right now, under Pat Bell, she came to me and said, Annie, um, listen, we have a group of students with similar needs, very few, a handful of students, but we're gonna get a program up and running. And that was, I think even maybe before you were on FinCom or that was early on in my time in Hadley. So let's say five years ago. And we did for the school committee, a cost avoidance analysis because it did require investment up front. But if you, if, if you looked at the fact that we have roughly four students served in that program right now, um, then you can see in terms of tuition, and tuition's range. So May Institute, highly specialized $120,000, are students who are in programs at the collaborative, that's closer to $53,000. Students who are in programs at public schools, in public school districts, but they're highly specialized, like a, a district started a program and is attracting other folks, they run closer to forty-five dollars to 50000 um, but even those four students, to your point, we said, well, at a minimum, without transportation, that's two hundred thousand dollars. So cost avoidance would be invest up front and create the program, which we did. But we can't we can't create. It's not cost effective to create a specialized program for every kind of type of disability, right? Then we have to start doing that analysis of what makes the most sense. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? No, it does. It's just very, there's a lot I don't know. Yeah. And that was interesting. Thank you for informing. Uh, but uh, if, if this is Paul Benjamin, if we, if we create a program like that, can we become a magnet for other school districts in our area that? Yes. Yeah, so we could, that? yeah, that was our, um, initially, even when we started the program that we have, we thought that quite possibly we might bring some other districts in and we always are open to that. So Paul, that can happen. It, Usually what happens is you design a program. Short answer is yes. However, just know usually what happens is a district designs a program because they know resources are tight in every town for the population they have. Mm -hmm. And so the first takers, of course, are their own students. And then you're, if there's seats available, then we might say, oh, can we fit into that one? But, but we, we conceivably can. Um, although if there's already a program that exists, particularly in another public school district, then the likelihood that we would be able to is less, right? If there's something that already exists out there. Well, I mean, if we, but if we come in under the, the dollar figure, yeah. because we yeah. have more efficiency, potentially, yeah. wouldn't yeah. that be, I mean, would it be worth checking with the other school districts to see if there's a need and if we have a common... Sure a common pool of students that we could yeah. uh, basically lower everybody's cost, including ours? Um, that's excellent. That's an excellent point. And I'm happy to go back to the special ed education director and say, what are you hearing out there? Is there something that we could do that would serve at least one? And, um, and are there others who are interested? Absolutely. Right. Okay. And please know that the most specialized programs, like when I referred to the high end of that, it is it is unlikely that a public school district would be able to replicate some of those. I mean, hence the reason their price tag, their price tag is so great. Understood. But, but I will absolutely talk with the special ed director about that. Can we answer any other questions for folks? Or do you have any suggestions? 
for us? Uh, I have a quick suggestion. David yep. Nixon here. Uh, we were um, talking to the uh, governor's office this afternoon um, about the reimbursements for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently they're trying to expedite those reimbursements. Usually when we have a flood or a uh, windstorm or snowstorm, they, uh, they do a, a total assessment of their entire emergency response. Um, and then they start sending money out to cities and towns. And with COVID-19, they want to take a much uh, uh, quicker uh, approach. So they're willing to do this piecemeal. If mm -hmm. you have, um, if you have uh, uh, expenses that you think are reimbursable, uh, MEMA, uh, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, has a web page where the instructions and forms for doing that are, are posted right there. Chief Spank may have a uh, analysis on how to do that, but uh, if you've got costs right now, I think you can get some money back uh, short uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you for that. Hey, David, or everyone, if I could suggest that when you're not actively talking, you mute your phone. Yep, somebody's tapping out there. Yeah. So, so uh, thank you, um, Dr. McKenzie, for going over all this with us. Um, there's a lot to, to go over with the school system. Um, it's such a big part of the budget, and I appreciate that we have a lot to look at. I, um, I, I, I uh, meant to mention this right in the beginning. Um, we're, we're just listening and, and trying to make things as normal as possible and listen to everybody's budget and going through everything, but everyone knows that there's big changes going on right now. Um, that's why I asked about um, how this is going to affect you money-wise with the closing of the schools. Um, we're going to have to re-look at all our re revenues. We're going to have to re-look at everyone's budget. Every, you know, everything is being looked at at this point. Um, so um, it, 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 it's, it's always good to try to figure out what's going on with the schools because that is such a big piece. And if I could... Uh Say again, let me, well, one thing I definitely want to point out on page one of the document, um, one, two, three, four, your fifth bullet, that increase of 280, almost 285, um, that should be the 258 that's in the chart. Sorry, that 285 was a, a, an original request, then we reduced it based on feedback from the town. Um, so I just, I, I didn't want you to catch that later and say, wait a minute, that's not what she said. That I apologize for that typo. And then let me say again, thank you very much to the fin Finance Committee, to the Select Board, to the town. I, we know at the school department, you have your work cut out for you. We know that. We also know that all of the elected officials in town are doing everything that they can to be responsible, to be responsive to department needs, to fund things that are good for the citizens. And there's a reality of there simply aren't unlimited resources. And now we're going to be facing a time in which resources are going to get really tight. We are very clear at the school department that when you have to make hard decisions, it in no way reflects a lack of support for schools in Hadley. This town has been very good to the schools. We appreciate that. We know you have hard work and um, we are open to whatever recommendations and parameters, we will work together to make things work for Hadley. I feel very strongly about that. So thank you so much for giving us the time to work with you. Thank you. And thank have you. you had enough of the technology? Is, has it been there since this happened? Because this was a total surprise to everyone. Have you been able to handle it? Did I just do there? Uh, we, um, so we have gotten, we've done some, some Chromebook deliveries. Uh, we, and thank goodness, what a great town we live in. So not only is our school department working hard to make sure everybody gets what they need, but just this town is so kind to its neighbors. So neighbors have helped neighbors um, in terms of families that may not have had internet set up or problems with devices. 
So right now we believe that at least every household has a device. We will probably need to get more devices out because you know, Amy, I mean, if you're a parent of kids who are saying, I've got to be on Zoom now. No, I have to be on Zoom now. And this is like a parent's nightmare, right? Managing the Zoom calendar at home. And so right now we're okay, but we anticipate utilizing uh, funds to, we're, we are absolutely, we have one grant that we got, which will get us 10 more Chromebooks immediately. And then we anticipate needing to buy more. Annie, I'm curious, you know, I feel like you're plugged in probably more than anyone else to um, the families in our town. And I'm just wondering, what is your sense of how we're doing, how, how our families are doing? Uh, so this is completely, obviously, anecdotal, not empirical, and in no way represents a representative sample. But I would say there is a range, right? We're not surprised by that. And that some people have been able to be flexible around this massive economic and social disruption to be more flexible or flexible with greater ease than others. Um, I will say that there are people who are really struggling we have heard from families uh, where the head of household is an hourly wage earner in the food service business, and they were in daily tears within days of this shutdown. Um, and they're afraid of how they'll make ends meet, of how they'll make get meals into their household. Um, so there's a range and there are people who are really, really struggling. And I will say again that um, you know, I got a, a text from somebody who's a part of representative government in town but doesn't do anything with the schools. It said, first of all, it was so great that your school department got internet for a family. That's my staff. I didn't even know we'd done that, but they sorted it all for this family and helped the family get access to free internet. And, um, and then this person said, and we, you know, um, let the family borrow some of our technology during this time. So, there are a lot of people really struggling and there are a lot of folks in Hadley that are showing up for each other. So I always say Hadley is a community that cares from cradle to its council on aging. It takes care of its citizens. And I've seen countless examples of that. Wow. Well, I, I appreciate uh, what the teachers are doing and how they're going out there and really helping out the kids and, and the emails that are coming home. Um, I know this is all new for the teachers. They're doing a fabulous job at it um, and keeping everybody engaged and trying to, to keep kids talking to other kids and, and, and also your emails still, even though they're not in school, I'm, I'm glad to still see your emails coming out to keep people uh, you know, informed of what's happening. So that's great. I know on the capital plan that you, we have in there for uh, computers coming up, um, so I, I'm thinking that that is probably a, a big need. It will be, and Chromebooks we've loaned with, our, with the expectation we scan them out and check them out with the expectation they will be returned. And we're also realists. We know our parents are extremely responsible. And again, let me say, I mean, parents are just trying to sort all this out. We've got a couple kids saying, I want the Chromebook. Now give me the Chromebook. These things are, not everything is going to, return exactly as it was. Not because people don't want to, but we're just realistic about that. Mm -hmm. And not to put you on the spot, but what's a Chromebook to a uh, to the system cost us? I assume we get uh, roughly idea. about say yeah. three hundred. Say $300, say roughly three hundred, Paul. I and, mean and how slightly less. What's and how that? How many do you, how many more do you need? Just uh, so the and also know this the tech article is not just Chromebooks. I have a detail on the tech article, so I'm not going to be able to do justice to that. Paul, let me answer that question correctly in email. Can I email the sure. finance committee with what's on yeah. there? Yeah, I will. Thank you. And, and you mentioned uh, a little bit about the, uh, uh, some of the people that are having a hard time with some of the money. Are we, I know in the beginning of the school year, uh, you fill out a form to see if you can get on the reduced lunch schedule, mm -hmm. you know, for the kids. Are there any people getting added on to that now? So uh, as it turned out, it, people weren't looking right away for meals. We do have some families that we've made arrangements for what we call like a, a box of groceries, because keep in mind, all of our perishables will not be good when we return to school. So we're trying to make sure we get those out to families. The truth is, Amy, we didn't ask. If somebody told us they needed food, they got food. So we didn't, we didn't 
required people to fill out more paperwork. We didn't, um, we just took care of that. So there isn't, there's an increase in free and reduced because we haven't required people to fill out the paperwork. No, I think that's wonderful. I wanted to just hope in that, you know, we were out there helping out people. Yeah. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, all of you. I'm going to jump off. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so uh, I guess, does anyone have anything to add before we go down the list? Uh, Al or, oh. Okay, so let's go uh, right to uh, series 500, uh, human services. David, what page are we looking at? 78. Okay. So the first one on the list is the Board of Health, it looks like. Uh, do we have Emma here? Or someone from the Board of Health? Um, okay, so let's skip that one for now um, and always be able to come back and maybe talk to the Board of Health. So the next one after that would be Council on Aging and I see Haley's here. Hello. Hello. How are you today? Well, thank you. Thanks for doing this. Um, so I've prepared just kind of an overview of our budget, um, what the most significant changes are, and um, some details regarding our grants. Um, Amy, I just put that into a document that I sent to you if you feel like you want to distribute it to the other members of the um, Finance Committee. Um, so in fiscal year 21, we'll expect two significant for us grants, um, one from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, um, which will be level funding with this past year because there's it's per person over 60 and the census count has not yet been updated. That should really change in the following year. Um, that amount is $16,668. Um, all of that will go toward the salary of Violet Suska, our program coordinator. Um, toward her salary of $40,000, $952 a year. We're also, ex we will be receiving a grant from um, the PVTA for the expansion of our van. Um, the amount of that grant is $12,265.16. Um, that is 50% of the predicted transportation costs based on a five day week program starting again in July. Um, I requested a 2% increase in the salaries of all staff members, including van drivers. Um, the overall budget increase um, for the, the whole thing um, that you have received from me is 7.43%, but I wanna point out that taking into account the reimbursement by the PVTA of 50% of the van costs, brings it down to a decrease of 2.66%. Um, so that the full budget that's indicated in the budget that you see before you does not, does not reflect the reimbursement of over $12,000 by the PVTA. Um, with, there's another new variable in the mix that I didn't account for in the budget originally. There's a new vehicle, there's a vehicle, there's a 2017 used Subaru that was um, given to the town. Um, it's property of the town um, with 100,000 miles on it. It's set aside for the use of the Council on Aging. So I would like to propose that we raise um, the maintenance, the van maintenance line item from $350 to $700 to possibly accommodate predictable maintenance and um, well, car fixes to the new to this vehicle, which has been reconditioned, and maybe we'll have no problem. But I want to be prepared. Um, I'll point out some of the biggest changes. Um, 
Let's see. I am requesting a pretty significant increase in recreational services from $800 to $1,200 because with the new building and anticipated um, increase in participation, which I, I feel very certain will happen, I think we wanna be able to utilize that space and be able to pay additional instructors, um, use new spaces that we've never had before, like an art room. Um, and we also have a fitness room with new fitness equipment, um, which requires some ongoing maintenance. And thus you will also see a maintenance fee for new equipment of $600, which is a new line item. Um, we currently serve 531 unique participants people over 60 in Hadley, I think that number will double. That's based on the predictions of, um, well, that's based on some of the field research that Suzanne Travisano and Jane Nevin-Smith conducted when they were researching new senior centers and the impact of new senior centers in communities. Um, those directors said that visitation was up 50% within the first six months. Um, so I do think that that's really going to have an impact on us as well. Um, so the most significant change you would see is a change in driver salaries. And that reflects the fact that we're moving from three days a week of service to five days a week. Um, but again, just remember that the PVTA grant will be reimbursing half of that amount. Another significant change you will see sort of was already um, already approved by town meeting in November. Lauren Hannigan, the outreach coordinator, um, in the beginning of fiscal year 20, was at 15 hours a week, and she increased to 25 hours a week in September. Oh, actually, this is 2019. In 2019, she increased her hours to be able to, to enable her to to do van scheduling in the, in the program and transportation program coordination. Um, and in November 2019, the special town meeting, um, residents voted to increase, to, to fund that increase. Um, also over $6,000 of that is the estimated cost of her time to schedule van services and half of that will be reimbursed by the PBTA grant. You might want some basic building updates. Um, I could see you being curious about that. Our move-in date as of right now is April 29th. That's stable for now, but I really don't know what the future will bring. I feel like any day now we could learn that for any number of reasons that won't be the date, but that's what it is today. Um, Rent has been paid for May of 2020 at Most Holy Redeemer Church, just in case there are changes um, with so many variables floating around. Um, and the cost of that rent is coming from the current building budget. And I think those are the main points that I wanted to bring to your attention. I had a question regarding um, the new building. And do you foresee your expenses being um, like for example, electricity, uh, heating, all that you're going from the old building to your new building. Is that going to be, um, usually a new building you're thinking maybe it's going to be uh, cost effective. So, you, I mean, it's going to be, you're not going to be losing out on all that heat, but at the same time, it's probably a bigger space than what you are used to. That's um, good. That's a significant increase. And the predictions for those um, utilities costs were submitted to um, David Nixon. They're not reflected in my town budget, but I can tell you, yes, that those costs are gonna be higher. Electricity is gonna be higher. There's gonna be propane. The cost of running that building is definitely gonna cost the town a lot more money. Well, I just, I, and I kind of wondered because it didn't look like your uh, budget did go higher at that point. So maybe the numbers weren't 100%, but I, we, I was looking because I was had questions regarding the, um, about, the, about that because I was, you know, I noticed that the libraries did go way up and I noticed the senior center didn't go up. So I kind of questioned why yours wasn't more. Because none of those expenses are in my budget. Okay. Okay. Right. 
So we'll have to just double check the numbers, what the numbers are and, and that they are the correct numbers for the building. So. I, there's no way for those numbers to be correct. I don't think okay. given the, the huge, there, there's no precedence to go on. So we can, if you want more detail about what I did to come up with those estimates, I'd be happy to provide that. And I can, I have a document I'm not prepared with it today because I, it's not part of my budget. Um, but I'd be happy to talk more about the logic that went into my guesses about what those figures would be. Okay, great. So down the road, I just, um, we reviewed it the last me, uh, one of the last meetings and it, there were, there was just some questions. So we wanted to ask you about that. Okay. Great. Thank you. And, and, um, the person that you're talking about increasing the community outreach coordinator, and I see, and you mentioned that that grant, is this an, will they, so once this grant, how long is this grant for? Is this a one-time thing, right? I think it could be, I, I think the idea is that it could be yearly. The PVTA is invested in reducing their own, reducing their need to provide transportation for older adults and disabled people. And so they give us this grant so that they can hand off some of those responsibilities and it's well worth their money for us to take assume total administrative responsibility for transporting this population. Okay. So I anticipate that if we report responsibly and have, um, and well, we don't even really have specific benchmarks of, of ridership, there's no particular minimum that I'm trying to hit. I think if we, if we report with accuracy and regularity, I have every expectation that we can repeat that grant. Okay. And so that line item you have, we have listed here for 25,000, but you mentioned the grant. So should I be, are we thinking that that's, we need to actually take money out of this, out of what we're looking at, right? Well, no, because the town has a responsibility to totally commit to that program and be reimbursed as it spends. So I believe that in, in order to preserve the, the terms of the grant, you need to approve the whole cost of the program with the understanding that you'll be reimbursed 50% on a monthly basis of what those expenses are. And the expenses fall into a few different categories, not only van drivers, but fuel, vehicle maintenance, and the scheduling that's completed by Lauren Hannigan. So on a monthly basis, when, when this begins in July, I will be reporting the various uh, expenditures related to those categories of the transportation program and then getting reimbursed within I think they I think that they pay within a month um, if they receive something promptly for me they will pay us back in a month but it's going to be throughout the year but they do insist in the language of the grant that the town commits to the full cost of the program at it expand at the expanded level of five days a week so Amy, I can I can attest to what Haley is saying it's because she and I had to go round the bush a couple of times on this grant because I didn't understand the terms of, until she explained it to me. Once I understood those terms, I understood the need to support this budget. So David, where are you listing the revenue part of it, uh, the money coming in? Revenue would be in a different section of the uh, of the budget book and the revenues. Sure. Did you? But did you account it? Did you? It'll be, under, it'll be under miscellaneous revenue. Oh, so you accounted for this? Yeah. Okay. I, I did want to mention one thing to Haley. Um, I it, it was a wonderful thing that I heard. Uh, my elderly father-in-law. He said that the senior center, who he he doesn't go. He's homebound pretty much. He doesn't go to out very often someone called him and offered to purchase you know offered to get groceries for you know set up the grocery thing and have the fire department help out and I thought that was just I, I couldn't believe you guys were doing that and reaching out to all our elderly people that's fabulous thanks Amy and a huge debt of gratitude is owed the fire department who are really playing an immense role in this its first day is tomorrow and I submitted 17 household grocery lists to them and they're going to try to shop for that for that many households and get those delivered tomorrow. And we'll see how it goes. But I'm um, 
I'm optimistic that this will work out and feel very happy that the collaboration has been able to take place. I, I do want to offer that if you do end up needing more help, I would be more than happy to help you out in any of that. So you can call me. Thanks, need. Amy. I'm glad to know that. Yep. Okay. Do we have anything else for Council on Aging at this time? I'm good. Okay. Nope. Good. No. Okay. I saw in chat that Emma said she is here and ready to go if we want to go back to Human uh, Board of Health. Great. Let's do that then. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me now? Hi, Emma. Hi. So we have your, we're on your page. So if you want to discuss uh, your budget, we are here and uh, we're on page 78 and we can listen to um, everything that you have there on your budget. <laughs> Sure. So I <clears throat> really wish that Greg and Dick were here as well on this call with me. Um, so we that pushed forward a, a budget um, that is going to increase several items. Um, one notably is our inspection services part of the budget. As everyone knows, I believe we have a lot of food service establishments in Hadley, and one of the many unfunded mandates for boards of health is that we have to inspect restaurants a minimum of every six months whenever there's a complaint and or a need for a follow-up inspection. Uh, public pools, we have to inspect twice a year, camps, and other things as well. In terms of also residential inspections, if someone wants a housing inspection, or if there is a concern for safety, and we have to enter a home for a home inspection. At this time, our current contract has only supported a total of 84 inspections with our current service line, which is only 27% of the inspections that occur, what should have occurred by our unfunded mandates last year. Um, last year, we had about 20 residential inspections, 30 to 50. Um, it was 30 complaint food inspections and other follow-ups as well involving nail salons massage followers, cons uh, cosmetologists, um, a podiatrist, and many other services that we had to follow up on. We also wanted to separate our line item for our burial inspection, increase the amount of postage and mileage and education that's covered, because certainly we, due to the increase in the amount of inspections and following the recommended procedures. We have to mail things a certain way. And as well as an increase with our new community health line item, which is for 3000, which would include water testing for our public waterways for recreation to cover E. coli and cyanobacteria, as well as um, processing and sending of animals to Bay State um, if there was rabies concerns, which are previously have not been funded under our budget, unfortunately, until the last several years. Um, and this year we've already had to send off one um, animal for that testing, which did come back negative, thank goodness. Um, and another line item, which we really appreciate is the administrative assistant, Mary Lou Lorenzo, we really appreciate thank her for her work and collaboration with us and really look forward to continuing that. But even with the amount of support that we have, we do not have regular staff. We are in the office every week. Um, Dick and I have done over 500 hours in the last year each, which is equal to a 20 hour position a week. Um, it's really an unmanageable workload and really an unexpected workload on an elected board. 
So we're looking for support that way. And that's all I got, I think. Do you have any questions? I, I do have a, a few questions. So the talking about the community health, that, that number has to do with the testing. Is that also the water testing? Because I know that we would, you had talked to CPA and we're, and that's gonna be going on the warrant for the water testing. Correct. That would include the, that water testing. The idea. So, if this was granted here, the three thousand dollars here, then you would not be needing the money from CPA. Correct. That is correct. Okay. And the other thing for the um, the inspections, you don't get when. So, is it? Is it for a regular inspection or only for a complaint? Is this only when someone complains that you have to do the inspection? For food establishments, we are required as an unfunded mandate from the state to inspect food establishments a minimum of every six months. And you don't, we don't charge for that? You we cannot. don't charge the restaurant for that? Correct. It is not standard practice that any health department charges for routine inspections. The only inspections that some health departments do charge for are complaint-based inspections, which we have brought up in our board meetings um, and have considered. Okay. All right, and uh, let's see. The only other thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, I think it had to do with the capital planning that we had put in for uh, on the warrant. It looks like the Board of Health is looking for IT, $5,000. We, we actually got that. We received that this past year. Right. Um, so I'm not sure why that's on there again this year. That's, that's what I was thinking. That was my question because I remember it went through last year. Yes. Okay. Our, our laptops are, and VPNs are working great. Um, and it was wonderful to already have that set up to be able to work remotely at this time. Okay. We really appreciate it. Um, and the last thing I did, I do see that you are looking for the, uh, the health our, coordinator. Yep. Um, are you getting any help from like the schools or anything like that? What do you mean help from the schools? Cause I, I just not sure what you're asking. And sure. I so like, I know, yeah. I know with this, uh, especially like a lot of calls and a lot of things, especially like nowadays with the virus and all, I didn't know if um, any of some of the work that, that you have to do at this point, if the, you know, school nurses or anything, any other departments are helping you. So the, the nurses are helping um, as of today. We, in terms of the COVID response, which certainly came much after we proposed this budget, this budget was just to support normal routine matters, not even in response to the current escalated effort, which we are currently working tirelessly on. Um, and I had a 130 Zoom meeting with our school nurses um, and we have figured out a pathway where they're able to help with that response. Um, in terms of the school nursing department helping on a regular basis, that's certainly not part of their normal workload. They typically have a very busy workload when the school's in session. So I think that would really have to be collaborated and worked on with in conjunction with Annie McKenzie. Um, but I'm certainly open to great new ideas moving forward. I didn't know if after this, you know, with what's happening and what 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 they've talked about and, and is happening in our environment, are you going to need to relook at your budget? Are you going to be able to do the inspections? I mean, if you're so busy with all this happening, I mean, is it realistic that inspections are going to be able to happen? Um, so. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so we actually contract out a portion of our inspections. That's that 84 inspections a year that we previously contracted. 
the reason for the increase in that budget line item is because we're looking to propose a new RFP that would include 200 inspections, um, which would only cover about 80% of the inspections that we have to do a year. All of those other inspections have typically been attempted to be absorbed by the Board of Health members, um, but as I'm sure you can imagine, they are very time consuming um, and we've had a lot of challenges being able to follow up on everything to make sure that our community is as safe as it, as it can be. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions? No. I'm good. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And we really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. There's a lot going on. And uh, we appreciate everything that you're doing, Emma, especially nowadays. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. I'm going to go have supper with my family. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Bye, Emma. Right, bye. All right. Wonderful. How, anything else? Uh, so we'll move on to veterans. Do we have anybody here from the veteran services? No. Okay, nothing's really changed much there anyways, so. Uh, let's see. Then I had the Oliver Smith will, but nothing's really changed there. Um, so the next thing I really see on our list would be uh, the library. Hello, can you hear me? This is Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Hey, um, so I, I guess I'll just go through the, the budget line by line if that works for everyone. Um, Do you want me to so, share the budget so everyone can see it? Uh, I think we're looking at, we all have books um, that, that were provided all the, um, so we're, we have the line items that I think David has put on the website. I just meant right. for other participants. I was just gonna share if you wanted me to. Oh, but I can't, it's blocked. You've blocked sharing. Oh, um, well, Jennifer um, would have to help if Jennifer can hear us about sharing. Um, okay. okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just start. Um, okay. So the, the first two lines for library salaries, um, we're, as you know, we're, we're planning to move into a new building. We're, we're operating under the assumption that the staffing will remain the same. The open hours will remain the same. Um, there is a slight increase there for us to have a little bit of wiggle room for uh, changes in the way that we that we operate in, in the sense that we're going to be sort of spatially challenged in a way that we have not been in the past in terms of being in a larger building with more space to cover different you know spaces that need supervision. So I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, at least one of our circulation staff may be able to work a few extra hours there. Um, so moving down the line, custodial services, obviously we don't have that anymore. That was consolidated into DPW's budget. Um, the energy costs for the, or utility costs for the library, um, as you know, were uh, consolidated into the 190 budget, I believe. I think David can confirm that. Um, but as you, as you can see, the, the, the cost of uh, you know, energy is greater in the new building than in the current building. It is a building that's three times the size. Um, we do have uh, very efficient systems uh, and the number, the number that we put forward was based on the projections that were provided by our architect's engineer. Um, this does not take into account the fact that we are currently striving to incorporate solar panels into the new library, which will cut that figure by somewhere close to half. Um, uh, and also it, it, it bears mentioning that in the current building uh, where we are now, we our energy costs are split between the gas which we use to heat the building as well as the electricity we use for you know all of the other power needs. In the new building, all of the systems are uh, more or less electric. Uh, there's a small uh, propane backup heater, but that really only comes into play when it's extremely cold. So we don't think that's a considerable expense. Um, 
other utilities um, or other other lines, computer resource services, we're you know looking to increase that slightly. We we do have um, you know money and capital for new technology, as well as some money in the uh, in the project budget for technology, various aspects. This is more for you know maintenance and upkeep of those uh, systems once they're in place. Um, tuition and meetings, we're you know. We took a little bit out of that because oftentimes there's a little bit left over at the end of the year, and that seems to be the right number. Telephone and internet, um, we cut that roughly in half. We're looking to switch to uh, wireless internet to, you know, for public use that is provided by CW Mars, our library consortium. So we will probably cut the uh, cut our cut our ties with um, with Charter uh, and no longer have that bill. So that that'll cut that down. Um, programs and activities, we're hoping to, well, we're just hoping to open under the circumstances with everything that's happening. But, uh, you know, we're planning to have a sort of a soft, quiet year uh, while we kind of get to grips with everything in the new in the new building. So programming probably will be slightly quieter than in some years. So we, we trimmed that down. Uh, office supplies, about where, where we were um custodial supplies i believe that went to D dpw as well um and our expenses for library materials is uh roughly where it was a, a little bit more than it was last year but we're, we're we have a formula that um that we have to adhere to for our certification by the board of library commissioners so uh so that comes into play when we're when we're formulating how much to spend on materials uh, and that that covers that, uh, and then dues the the line for dues and memberships that actually is for our uh, CW Mars consortial membership, uh, and that is the the number that was um, shared with us uh, this winter from CW Mars to tell us what we were going to owe more than likely for the coming year. And so you know, as a as a budget, obviously it's a little different than it was last year because many of these the expenses have been consolidated into that larger building maintenance uh, section of the budget. But um, but most of the things that we have control over are you know roughly where they were last year. We don't have any major changes and we're just going to um, see what it's like to operate in the new building before we you know make any proposals for major changes to our budget. Yeah, this is, uh, I'd like to see this type of budget when a lot of uh, uh, things going down. So, yes. So this was great. Um, you answered pretty much my question. I, I, I mean, I did have that question, um, which I had brought up to the Council on Aging uh, about the um, heating of the building. Um, so maybe you're I, I was wondering whose whose um, figure was incorrect? Was it your figure or was it the senior center figure? So it, incorrect in what sense? Well, I had showing that you you have a new building and the senior center has a new building. The senior center heating and their electrical stayed the same, it looked like, but yours went considerably higher. So if I'm comparing the two, I, I didn't understand why that was. So one of them I felt was off. Okay. Well, as I said, we, you know, we went to the engineer because we really had no, no idea how to budget for this. And we, you sure. know, use the projections for, uh, for energy usage that they provide. We'll, we'll have to see how accurate they are, but that was how we went about formulating the number. Okay. The other thing, Amy, is that the senior center is heating with propane. Okay. And that's a totally different cost than electric. Is the library heating with electric? Yes. And what was it's the library heating with before? Uh, uh, we're, we're currently heating with gas. We have a gas furnace that was installed, I, I don't know, sometime within the last 10 years, probably five years ago, five or six years ago. So you're changing that. So, going so we're changing that, yes. Okay. And we have, I mean, we do have air conditioning over here, which is electric, um, but it's in the new building. The system is, it's one sort of consolidated system. It's it's a, a form of mini split uh, technology and it's, it's, um, it is all electrically powered. Okay. Okay. I don't uh, really. Are so? Are you open? Open for people to come to see you now? Currently not. 
we're we're following the uh, you know the advisory from the board of library commissioners that um, you know we tried to provide limited service where the building was closed but people could still borrow materials for pickup uh, and we were strongly advised against doing that by the board of library commissioners and um, as the situation became more and more serious we we decided we really should be erring on the side of caution um, until until there's some sign that it's it's more. Uh, safe you know because we are sharing materials that are going from person to person so we, you know i can't really argue with the reality of that under the circumstances uh, you know we did have a few uh thoughts on how to mitigate that but there's no way that we can totally you know eliminate the possibility that someone will, someone would come to work sick and then you know someone could get sick being handed materials from you know from a staff person that didn't even know they were ill so uh, i couldn't really argue with that logic and we decided to uh to err on the side of caution because you know a lot of our a, a large part of our patronage you know it, it overlaps with the council on aging and we you know it's it's an older population much of it and we feel like the risk could be you know great to older members of the community this you know this virus being what it is yeah yeah no that's so i, 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 just, I agree it probably should be closed i i think that's a good idea Amy, I just wanted to jump in and say, I think at this point, all libraries are closed, um, unfortunately. And I think that's sad because people really want books, but um, the Mass Board of Library Commissioners didn't really leave much wiggle room. And um, what Patrick didn't explain is um, his staff is doing a lot of online programming and like videos, um, read alouds. So they're trying to really reach the town in different ways. Um, free resources like um, Audible has free books right now. They're posting information like that. That's the, the best we can do for our community right now, at least. Yeah, some of the, you know, some of the services that we pay for um, by being members of uh, CB Mars, that includes the overdrive uh, service, which is for Audio, you know, electronic uh, audiobooks and ebooks that people can borrow. So people are still able to to tap into that. Uh, the library started offering the Canopy film streaming service, which allows library patrons to stream. I think the number right now is ten um, films per month. So you know, there are still things that we're offering, um, and and as Joanne says, we are trying to work on devising more programming that we can put online so that you know, families can see a friendly face like our children's library in Luna. Um, and so we're trying to figure that out. This is all new for us. And um, we're trying to figure out what works and what people will respond to. But we are hoping to collaborate uh, with Hadley Media on, on some of these projects, as well as, um, you know, other departments, if we can find ways to work together. Great. Wonderful. All right. Um, it's pretty straightforward budget, so I don't really have a lot a lot of questions here. Um, if any of anybody else in, has questions for Patrick. Oh, thank you. It's very clean. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, presenting, and it's good for everybody to go over all the line items and just to try to understand the budget. Uh, so, but it, it is pretty clean this this time. So, <laughs> thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Okay. All right. So the next one um, that we have listed is the historical uh, commission. Anyone from historical? Oh, I, I skipped park and rec. Let's jump back. <laughs> I did. I skipped. Okay. How about park and rec? Oh, there's Jenny. Hi, Jenny. I was sparing you the video until uh, I had to talk. <laughs> I also have the commissioners here as well. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. If you want to go on over, uh, just, you know, explain a little bit about your budget, especially it's new to some people too. Okay. Um, so we actually have a pretty simple budget. Um, just uh, my salary. Um, we asked for an administrative um assistant salary um and then just the school use the 
custodial school use, um, tuitions and meetings. Um, we no longer need telecommunications, um, office supplies, mileage, and equipment purchase. Only out of, if you skip down past the, um, to like the admin and my salary, if you skip past that, there's only three of those that um, I increased by a small percentage because um, those are the three things that I find myself using more of. So with custodial use and school use, uh, because Park and Rec doesn't have a set place to hold things um, and we find ourselves, you know, um, quote unquote, renting the school to use for um, our programs and things, I bump those up by 5% and then mileage because I have to run out and get things for programs and um, supplies for after school and things like that. So I bump that up by two and a half percent. Um, I did request a step increase this year, um, which looks like um, they're not, well, was denied in the first round, I guess you could call it. Um, and the admin um, assistant, we had asked for a position of um, 19 hours a week for the full year at $15 an hour. Um, we could cut that down to a 40 week position. So like a part time for part of the year at um, 15 hours a week, which would make that number um, $9,000 instead of um, the original 14,800 request. So it could cut that down a little bit. Um, but being a department of one and running all the programs that we do and being offsite, sometimes it would be good to have that second person in the office to help with that stuff. Uh, are, who's running the uh, after school? So the after school is run through the school department. Um, and we have, there is somebody there that runs the program. Um, I do the billing and the emailing to the parents for that side of the after school. So I actually work um, seven and a half hours of my schedule goes to the school. I do the billing, um, the snack purchasing, and some of the back and forth with the parents for that program. To clarify, seven and a half hours is 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 paid for through the after school program. Yeah, I guess that would be. A uh, I was going to say you work a little bit more than seven and a half hours a week. So that's when when we look at the uh, salary, the amount requested, the forty nine thousand four hundred eight, is that, and in addition to that, you also are getting money from the school. No, is that correct? No, that's as a total. So. Originally, when um, when I emailed it to David, there's a second box underneath that gets broken down, but it doesn't get put into the to the document that gets printed off. That just the whole number gets put in there. Um, but the, to have it broken down more, um, only thirty nine thousand five hundred and twenty five of that would come from from the, I guess the, that fund. And then the seven and a half hours would be $9,881. And that's re that's reimbursed from the after school funds. Right, from the after school. So it's split up in two, two separate amounts, but the total of it would be the 49. So David, how do we calculate for that? In the past, what we did was we just kept that off the budget and just had it flow through a uh, special revenue fund. Um, that's not a particularly good way of handling it. So if you look at the uh, history of this line item from uh, FY19 to FY20, you see a big jump. That's because we uh, made that adjustment in the budget to better reflect uh, what we're really paying uh, Jen, Jenny there. Um, and then the, the funds, uh, get, uh, again, put into the revenue side of the, of the budget. So if I think I understand this right, because we're actually not, you know, we might allocate for all this money, but we're really only spending the 30 something thousand. 
all that extra money at the end would be go roll into the free cash. Yeah. Okay. Why can't we do it? And you just say we can't, we can't just do the right amount. Well, we tried that and we found that we were tying ourselves in knots, uh, trying to reconcile the budget at the end of the year. Okay. So uh, for accounting purposes, this is a better way of doing it. Okay. Yeah, um, and, and certainly we'd like to also advocate again for the uh, step raise for, uh, for Jenny. It was, uh, um, we did ask for it initially and it was taken out without much discussion. Um, we feel that based on uh, the amount of time that she puts into it, uh, as well as, I don't know how, how much I need to advocate here, but uh, when we look at that 2018 um, study that the town paid for, uh, um, Jenny is uh, actually below the minimum uh, for a park and rec director um, from an hourly standpoint. So we were trying to just give her a step raise to uh, recognize her contribution, particularly with taking on all the additional workload of the after school program. And um, again, that was removed from the budget um, without any discussion. So I'd like to advocate for that again. Okay. Did uh, Jenny, you speak with uh, Ed on Human Resources? Um, I, I've actually, the couple times that I've invited him down to talk about Park and Rec, he hasn't responded to that. So, so um, I think. Uh, not that we, I, what I think we should do with the salaries, because I found myself getting into this with one of the other one um, meetings with, when it started with the assessor, I believe that our job is to figure out a way to where to pay for everything. But as far as who, who gets the money it should I mean we should is who gets the step increases who gets the raises it probably my feeling is it should go through HR which we never had an HR before so that's one reason why people didn't know but I should go through HR then go through David and then be approved by the select board when the select board does do the approving of it then we will have to pay for it so um I completely understand. I just want you to, I don't, I don't think that I'm in the spot to be the, or we our, our board is in the spot to say who deserves the step and who doesn't, because I think everybody deserves the step, but I'm not there to say who gets what. And, and I never saw the studies. I, I think you have, you have a very good argument, then you should take that to the human resources and then bring it up through David and then go through the select board. If it's deemed that that needs to be in there, we will have to figure out a way to pay for it. That's can I ask Can I ask who decided in the first place that, that that was, like, why was it declined in the first place? Well, it's, it's that, this was just the first pass through the, um, and before the finance committee even got a, to look at it. We hadn't seen the book in, or the, these first pass through. So this was the first, this isn't the end all, this was just the starting spot. And they tried to, but, and it was, you know, it's a big puzzle and you're trying to balance the budget. And right, so who, did, so who was that? Who was that first pass through? So you go through David and, and it goes through town hall, um, the, the first pass. And then we are gonna talk to everyone about each line item. But um, you wanna reach back out to, um, it would be to Ed and to David. And I don't know if you wanted to speak on this, David, at all at this point, or you want to wait. Let's um, tell you what, Jenny, let's uh, have a through a conversation with uh, Ed in the morning, okay? Sure. All right. Okay. So, um, so that's how I, I, because we don't, I don't want to get in the middle I, of who um, should get it because of, uh, um, if, if, if the other departments would be coming to me as well. <laughs> yeah. Understood, a Amy, thank you very much. I mean, it was just, uh, like I said, we, we haven't had an opportunity to get on the platform to advocate. And in the past, uh, prior to the HR department, this used to be one of the forums um, quite some time ago, perhaps, that uh, advocacy was, was, was uh, uh, you know, had to justify these types of things, so. Yeah. 
Now, I do want to point out um, this budget is the first pass through, and this was all done when everything was perfectly normal and there was no concerns um, with the COVID-19, right? So everything has changed at this point. Um, you might be looking at this and saying, well, this department may have gotten an increase or this person did. That's not necessarily so at this point. Um, it might look like that in the book, but I think this whole uh, uh, budget is um, in, we are going to be looking at each item and having to rebalance right. a lot of things. So right. um, I just didn't want you to think that everything you see here might be set in stone because it's not. Right. Okay, um, great. Does anybody else have any questions for Park and Rec? I'm good now. We're good? Set. Okay, well, Park and Rec has a big uh, thing coming up too. They're looking to put some equipment into Zacharka Park. So that's pretty exciting. And that looks like that might give them um, some more things going on. And that's a big, a big challenge. You yeah. know, we've actually, um, for the last week have been posting an indoor. They um, they launched a op, hashtag opt inside uh, indoor fitness plan uh, kind of leading up so that people who have been using their equipment or will be using their equipment can try the workout inside with, with no equipment. So if you go on our Facebook or on our Instagram, you can uh, see the directions to download the app and you can watch the video and you can do the workout. Um, right there. So I've been posting stuff every day regarding that workout. Um, today, I actually posted a kid's workout. Um, and every day I've been posting crafts, different crafts the kids can do uh, with household items. So the parents don't have to go out and get anything. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I bet you a lot of people wish that that was um, existing. Now it's the Turkey Park <laughs> since all the gyms are closed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So I guess that's just one more reason why it would be a, a good thing for the town of Hadley, right? Yep. We appreciate your support. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I don't have, um, um, oh, can we, the, you, no, you mentioned the custodial. So that's just because you're using the school more. Um, okay, I have no other questions on, on your, um, so if any, if nobody else does, thank you. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. David, I'll email you, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so let's go right to the next series. Um, it would be the fire department, page 63. All right. Hi, Mike, are you here with us? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am here. You're here? Okay. All right. Well, you got quite a, uh, um, I don't know if you want to go over anything with us now or, I mean, go over a bunch of things or just hit the highlighted items or how you'd like to handle it. I, I know we got some uh, new people that are interested in your budget. I mean, just because it is one of the bigger ones. Absolutely. Um, there are some changes to this budget based upon uh, moving accounts to different locations, obviously. Uh, but to start out with, um, one of the big ones that you'll see is there's an increase of 85,000 for uh, fire full-time salaries. And basically that includes, um, we have, we've been in discussions for about two years about uh, trying to put multiple hats together for folks, uh, for department members. And obviously the fire department is still, still struggling. Um, I can tell you this has been quite the education having to, to deal with the situation we're going through right now. And I wanna thank all of the the members of the department, the police, uh, our dispatch center, I can tell you that they're, they're just, it's, it's nonstop for us daily, um, along with town administration, board of health, the schools, Annie has been outstanding. Um, 
just everybody has really come together on this whole situation, but it's really kind of brought to light how we are really stretched thin um, and it's made it a challenge. But uh, in discussions with David and with select board members, we were talking about the need for some type of IT assistance. And myself and Chief Mason sat down and uh, discussed the, uh, the concept of putting together a firefighter IT position. And it was based upon looking at um, some, basic, some basic work that could be done throughout the community, uh, not just in police and fire. Uh, we obviously have a pretty extensive system with our IMC, IMC, which is on the police side, and then also our reporting system on the fire side. Um, we, also, we also know that the town struggles at times with trying to get uh, assistance with some smaller items. So doing a quick uh, wage survey of that, we're trying to actually cover two positions, add a firefighter and also an IT position uh, to the fire department. It would adjust our, our, our staffing arrangement a little bit where we would actually have, uh, if you base it upon an eight day system because we're a four on, four off uh, work group. Uh, so basically we have right now we have two firefighters that are on daily. It's a four on, four off schedule. They work up to 48 hours of straight time. After the 48 hours, they move into overtime. Um, and that's based upon FLSA laws for uh, first responders. Um, so what we were looking at is if we could add this additional em employee, not only the, could they assist with smaller uh, in-house issues, both at the fire police department, but also throughout the community, uh, the other departments with smaller issues with IT. Um, this would allow us to potentially gain some 24 hour coverage in the department to try and cover some of the overnight issues that we're still experiencing. Um, obviously, you know, we go back to a call force department from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And uh, you'll see in the upcoming uh, town town report that we responded to over 1500 calls for service this year. And um, it, it's not getting any less. I can tell you that uh, our staff is, has been working, we, we're, we're pretty spent right now with all the stuff that's going on right now. Uh, but I think this is a good fit and in discussions with David as well, I think we, we both agree, agree uh, if it's possible uh, to do this. Uh, we would love to try and fund this under an assistance to firefighter grant. Unfortunately, the grant does not allow for anything other than a entry level um, firefighter. So it, it would not have somebody that would have that skill set for um, for the IT side. That's a pretty extensive skill set. Uh, so that's what we're looking at for that. That's that portion of the budget. We are doing a two percent cola for. We are doing a 2% COLA for the department mem members based upon HR, the HR director's recommendations. Uh, so that's one of the big ones. Uh, you'll see gas electric, obviously the North Station right now, the North Station uh, was $1,200 in heating oil and is moving up to $13,600. Uh, that's getting moved into the 196 account under the town administrator's uh, budget. Um, just so you know, in an effort to try and save some funding, it was recommended by the fire department, uh, to purchase all the underground storage tanks for propane that you're seeing. So the library, uh, the fire department, I believe the, I'm sorry, the senior center and the fire department both have underground storage tanks that have been purchased by the community that allows you to actually shop for the best price for your propane, which I think will assist the town administrator in being able to, you know, get a better rate. Uh, if you lease the tank, normally you're locked into a specific rate on that. So th I think that was a good choice by all of us. Um, again, the utilities that you're seeing that was backed out by David, I completely understand and agree with that, that that needs to happen for uh, gas, electric, water, sewer. Um, this is not a manned station at this point, the North Station. Uh, so, um, we, you know, we're not really sure what we're looking at. It would be obviously kept to the uh, bare minimum for heat. Um, it's a, uh, the entire 
slab has a, a radiant floor heat system and which is very efficient underneath the trucks so hopefully that will lower the amount of propane we will need uh, this this building is set up so that if we had to become operational if our main station went down we would have the ability to operate out of, the, out of this center with the situation we're facing today it's it's become even more um, prevalent as to why we need to have this site set up uh, this will have a redundant dispatch center uh, Lieutenant Cook has been working with uh, East Hampton. We're, we're, we're putting plans together if our staffing uh, happens to go down and we have to close our dispatch center, uh, how we're handling that for mutual aid with you know East Hampton, which is our backup 911 center, and then in, in, in reverse for them if they have an issue. Uh, so all of this has kind of been a great education for us on top of the fact that you know it, it's really reaffirmed how important the station will be. So that's another big one for us. Um, as you drop down, you'll see there's a pretty substantial increase on the building maintenance center in North. And I just want you to, to I want you to clearly understand what that means. Um, the town administrator, myself, and the DPW director met, and we felt that it was critical that certain uh, certain items be handled by the fire fire department because they're under the fire department's purview. So this increase you'll see includes uh, generator maintenance, sprinkler, so the fire sprinklers that you have in the buildings, fire alarm security, uh, both the senior center and the North Station have hood suppression systems for their cooking equipment. This includes fire extinguishers. Uh, so this is for all the buildings in town. Um, this is center, the center station, the North Station, the senior center, the town hall, the library, the Callahan Wells uh, uh, building, the DPW and wastewater. So that, and it also includes the extinguishers for the Hopkins Academy, uh, Hopkins Academy, Hadley Elementary School and the superintendent's office. So um, this is all inclusive. It also will still include the Goodwin uh, you know, the previous Goodwin Memorial Library, because there is a fire alarm and they also have extinguishers there. So that's why you're seeing such a sizable increase in that. And that's based upon all estimates from the individual companies. Uh, so for example, our annual sprinkler bill for the center station is $1,300. Uh, it's about $1,300 for a quarterly uh, sprinkler inspection that's required by not only our insurance company, but uh, building code and NFPA standard. Um, our fire alarms for the center station is about $830 for the year. We are looking at potentially trying to getting get the monitoring side of this cleaned up and moving all of our monitoring into our center station. So the dispatch will actually have the ability to, instead of uh, if a fire alarm goes off, it goes to a private company, it will go directly to the center station and would be dispatched by our dispatchers. So we're trying to set up uh, some savings there. Um, so that could potentially be a decrease in that line if that happens. Uh, we're just, we're working on that as part of this build out of the North Station. So that was the most sizable uh, increase you would see. Um, telephone, cable, and internet, those are actual costs for our cell phones, uh, the, you know, our 911 phone, uh, our portion, uh, police and fire split that and then our cable internet costs. Uh, I know that Jennifer is looking at potentially pulling some of this over into her budget, uh, into the, uh, uh, the town hall budget, which is fine. Uh, Chief Mason and I discussed this further, and it sounds like she has a good plan for maybe trying to save some costs there. Uh, so we're totally willing to work on that. As far as the cell phones though, that would remain consistent for us because that includes our emergency management cell phones, which right now are deployed uh, we have one that's been deployed to public health. We have one that's deployed to um, the town health nurse, and we have one that's deployed to uh, the live, uh, the council on aging. So we we've done call forwarding, or we've set up set it up so that they can receive calls as they work from home. Uh, so that's important that, that stays under our, under our budget. Uh, the other the other parts are all mostly just um, increases in costs. So the turnout sets. Every year, I give you an updated cost for so cost increase for our turnout gear. We're trying to stay ahead of the curve. You guys were gracious enough to provide us with an update on turnout gear. 
and the decision was to keep five sets of turnout gear in our in our uh, in our annual budget so that we can uh, not have to come back with a large number. Um, turnout gear cannot be used after ten years. Um, you, you're not you're not allowed to train at a fire at the uh, Mass Fire Academy, and it's also not compliant with NFPA standard. So we're trying to keep ahead of that curve and not have to come back with a large equipment uh, request for that again. Um, and then also our air pack, there was a 5% increase in, in the cost of air packs. I can tell you that the stands are, standards for these packs are ever changing and it's hard to keep up with it sometimes, but uh, both OSHA and NFPA standard are adding specific requirements of these. So we're doing our best to try and phase in um, rather than giving you a big bill. And also we're always trying to find and, and apply for uh, grants for this. It's just difficult because the the federal government grants, unless they're completely out of date and expired, which ours aren't uh, at this point, it makes it difficult to, they don't understand that you might have uh, equipment and turnout gear that has been used and is abused. And, um, you know, you go into a fire and you beat up an air pack, there's really not much you can do about it. You're going into a fire, but uh, they look at the date rather than um, the, the state of the equipment. So we're always trying to try and find uh, try and find equipment for our, our grants for that. So those are those are the highlights, the the big stuff for us. So uh, that's what I have. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I just to go over again, just to uh, jog my memory because I'm trying to remember. So for a while, it was just you and one other and the fire department. Then. Then we gave you the big boost. And how many firefighters did we end up hiring all together? So uh, we applied for a safer grant and we were denied based upon because of the finances of the town. Uh, that's what came back is their recommendations. But we were, you, uh, the town added four positions. Four. At the time we had, uh, Lieutenant McKenna was the fire prevention. He took my job when I became the fire chief. Mm -hmm. So when we added the four positions, Lieutenant McKen McKenna became one of the two lieutenants that are on the four on four off schedule. And we brought on board Evan Bryant, my lieutenant, uh, my deputy chief, who's also the assistant emergency management director. Uh, so uh, he's salary, he's on a salaried schedule. Uh, and then we have two, uh, we have two full time firefighters firefighter EMTs, and then the two lieutenants. So you have uh, Lieutenant Washkevitz and Lieutenant McKenna. So a total, including yourself, is how many? Six? Six. We have six. Six. Okay. And so, and then last year, I know that it was, it was tough. Um, you wanted another, because you took them out of your budget, tried to help out. And so you needed an admin. And then you tried to put in for one, we, it wasn't given at first, but then they did grant. I don't, I don't necessarily know if it was the hundred percent of what you needed, but close to it to get that admin. Did you get that? Yes. The, the, it was not, it was not, the position was not, um, the position has not been filled yet. I was working with HR on that. Um, so that position was funded partially. And then at that, uh, I believe that would have been the fall town meeting. The remaining funding was applied to that. Um, we're, I was working with the HR director and we have two applicants in place right now, but obviously this is not a good time to bring a new employee in. Um, so there is that funding that will be uh, residual there, um, because the position has not been filled at this time. All right. So looking at that, the numbers, would that be listed under the wages of full time that that part of the admin, right? No, the admin is its own line. It's the 5112. Oh, okay. Admin salaries. That's the 15,000. Correct. And that was uh, basically the, uh, I worked with the HR director. We came up with that grade and step uh, to allow for the maximum number. It was 19 hours per week, I believe. Uh, okay. that we factored at, at a grade. Um, he established the grade and the step. Okay. So if I understood you right, right now, the increase, the really increase for the full-time wages, um, you were, 
is for two is the two percent cola and 70 let's see you had in here change of seventy thousand dollars and that's for two more employees one that's for I one more employee and i had asked david david was going to adjust the uh location where the money came out of um i told him that if i just don't want to go down the road where like what happened last year where I pulled money out of our, our part-time wages and our training wages to fund the administrative position. Yeah. Uh, but I did tell David that if, uh, if the town was willing to support this new position, that I would pull $15,000 or uh, we would make it so it was a $70,000 uh, ask. So I would pull that funding out of the the part-time wages to cover the cost, you know, some of the cost of the full-time position. I see. That's the 15. Okay. And, and the overtime, I do see that we, we are increasing on the overtime. Now, can't we use the call force still instead of doing overtime? We have no. been trying to use call force, but call force has full-time jobs during the day. Uh, so we have to, uh, the deputy chief and myself, we have been covering shifts. Uh, yeah. So coming in at 6 a.m. and to try and alleviate that, I mean, we're looking at $8,900 of overtime just to cover. That's based upon what we were seeing this year. Um, we're doing everything we can, but there's on, only so much gas in the, in the tank for myself and the deputy. When we have an opportunity to bring a call force person in, we are, but it's a little bit logistically difficult because they, uh, you know, we can't bring in somebody that doesn't know how to operate one of the trucks right now. We have some newer staff uh, that we're working with, um, but, you know, we, we, we have folks that are working during the day, so it makes it a bit of a challenge. But any time that we have the ability to bring somebody in uh, from the call force, we are. If not, myself and the deputy are doing everything we can to cover those shifts so there's not additional overtime. So, and those, some of those, like, are they part of the, I know a lot of our people are EMS, are they part of the ambulance? Are they going out with that ambulance? Our, our staff, our, our model, our response model yeah. is that for daytime, for daytime calls, our firefighters that are on duty our full-time firefighter EMTs are responding with the ambulance to medical calls. And um, there's multiple reasons why we're doing this. First of all, it's to improve uh, the return or the, the time to the hospital and return time for the ambulance to get back. It's also for additional hands, all hands on deck. I can't tell you the number of calls that our, our firefighters are actually driving the ambulance for um, you know, there, there's times when you have a full cardiac arrest going on. Sometimes our firefighter is driving so that the EMT and the paramedic can actually be in the back of the bus working on the patient. Um, lift assist, uh, folks that need, you know, we need constantly need help getting people in and out of spaces. Um, and, and so we're, we're there in that support role. Uh, so in the event during the day, so 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., if, if there's a if there is a medical call, our folks, uh, it's a little bit different right now with this um, with the COVID nineteen situation going on. We are kind of stepping back from. We are still responding, but we're waiting outside, so we're staging. Uh, just in the event they need assistance, we'll stage. Uh, we're trying to limit exposures to our to our responders at this point, but we still need to be there in the event that something happens. Um, because some of these folks are really sick. Um, and then, uh, sec so second to that is if those two staff go out and it's during those hours, myself and the deputy will cover the station if a second call comes in. So we then go out on the fire truck if necessary. We don't see a very large response back during the day for call force folks. Again, everybody has their daytime jobs and are, you know, they're busy. Obviously, right now, uh, there is some angst in the department and we are trying to stagger crews coming in. Um, you know, if we have one person right now, currently everybody that comes into the station needs to have a temperature taken and they have to fill out a sheet 
uh, with multiple questions asking them if they've been exposed to anyone with COVID, if they have any other symptoms. Um, so our, we're pretty much on lockdown in our station to make sure that we're not knocking ourselves out here. Uh, I had an hour, hour long conference call today with chiefs from the area on how we're going to be able to support each other with mutual aid uh, in the event one of our departments becomes um, unable to respond to medical calls and fires. So we, we, we've been working substantially because, you know, we've had a number of, of uh, departments that have actually had to shut down and um, just because of exposure. So we're, we're constantly on high alert for this and doing everything we can to limit exposure. But that's the, the basis of, of uh, our response for medicals. We're doing everything we can to, to stage. We have a very strict policy on decon, uh, so decontaminating anything uh, that comes out from a call and in support of our ambulance as well. When, when you go out on the call, how many, how many do uh, go out with you? For a medical call? Yeah. So for the medical call, it's the ambulance responds and then the, the day crew of two goes. They respond in our utility truck. Yeah, two people, I right? just did Correct. okay. Yep. And uh, let's see, anybody else have any questions? Yeah, Chief, you said you have 1,500, was it 1,500 calls, responses now? That's correct. Oh. How many, uh, I, I know that uh, you guys have to go out to certain car crashes also. Do, do we respond to all, all of those or, do, or just when, you know, uh, the first responders say, oh, that there's a need for a fire truck or what's the procedure in our town? So the procedure for us is uh, based upon um, past incidences and uh, past practices. Our protocol is that all motor vehicle accidents, unless it's a common sense fender bender in a parking lot, uh, we are dispatched, uh, which I can't even say anymore in the parking lots because we've had some real good ones there too. But um, the protocol is, is that we are toned off for all motor vehicle accidents if PD, if the police department arrives on scene and determines it's minor in nature yeah. and um, is an exchange of information or whatever, then they call in and our, our forces are, uh, they stand us down. So we don't respond. The reason why this was put in effect, this was actually put into place uh, with myself and past uh, Chief uh, Kitsa. We had multiple incidences where the accident was much more severe. So the initial call that came into the 911 dispatcher was from a passerby or somebody not involved with the accident. We actually had two instances where folks were actually trapped in the car mm -hmm. um, and we didn't have fire resources responding. And in one case, uh, one of the passengers actually was unresponsive and the ambulance at the time, which was Amherst, was unable to get into the car because there was no uh, resources there from the fire side. So we have a pretty strong um, protocol now that's been working out quite well. Like I said, our dispatchers are, are really on top of it. We're continuously updating our, our response protocols, but you know, we're looking, still looking at close to 400 plus calls a year uh, for motor vehicle accidents. Um, and I hope my numbers are right, but I'm pretty sure that's what the number is. Um, and obviously fire responses are, you know, structure fires are kind of low right now, obviously, which is great. Um, we're doing our jobs with inspections and and all that are and all that stuff, um, and trying to you know have safe buildings. But uh, the number of calls that we have, there, there's so many different types of calls. It's 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 overwhelming. Wow. Uh, so. Thank you. Yep. Uh, one one quick thing, Mike. I just was wondering. Um, I think it is, you know, I understand where you're coming from important to go out on the medical calls. And I see what you're saying. And with Amherst, they are the fire department uh, when they go sometimes too. But I'm curious on action. Now, action's out of Holyoke and uh, I think Pittsfield. Do you know, do, when they go out, do they have the fire department come too? Do they help? And, and, and the reason why I'm asking, I'm thinking, are we just, um, is this really good service on us? Maybe is it something I don't want to push our butt, you know, push our luck because the ambulance has been wonderful, 
but maybe do because of such good service on us, do we, do we get something back from the ambulance on all your service? Well, we are, we are getting something back. So, um, you received the full reimbursement yeah. as as here. Uh, so the entire contracted rate was reimbursed to the town. Yeah. So the 267,500. Um, what we're looking at and we're hoping to have a plan for you coming shortly as part of the five year implementation plan is to look at a Hadley fire based ambulance to actually cover the second and third calls. We're seeing a lot of second calls and third calls that are covered by Actions Med 2, which is stationed at the bridge. And that revenue is not coming into the town of Hadley. That's going to Action directly. Um, Action is very much in favor of supporting us. Uh, and we have some real good hybrid approaches working with UMass to try and uh, utilize some of their, uh, their EMTs that they have. They have 128 EMTs at UMass. So we're, we're working on a bunch of different plans, which unfortunately have been kind of put on hold with the mess we're in right now. But um, we're, we're, we're really looking to try and phase in at some point to be able to support with funding, you know, some bringing in some funding for these second and, and third calls that we're missing either to action or calling mutual aid ambulances from Amherst, Northampton um, and the other departments. Yeah. Uh, good. So um, do you want to uh, continue um, on this with the amb since the ambulance is on the next page, anything else you want to add regarding the ambulance? Um, so I believe the select board uh, and David, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we were requested to go back to action. And so basically we're in the second year of our contract and there was a clause for a third year if we so chose. Um, I believe the select board, I don't know if they voted on it yet or not, but I believe that they wanted to actually move to actually start a whole new contract with them. And David, is that, is that correct? So that we had the two years. Right. So, that yeah, we would... so, they, so rather than extend it by one year, they want to extend, basically extend it uh, for two years. So they want us Mike and you and I need to work on this this week, I suppose, uh, to extend that, uh, to create a new contract for ambulance services for years three and four, for FI 21 and 22. Yes, that's correct. And I, yeah. I thought I completely agree with David's model on this. I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, we're, we're still, we're, we're obviously still ever growing here. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting with this time where with everybody home now with this, uh, calls have decreased a little bit, but we're still getting calls for medical services. So, um, I can tell you that action has been outstanding. It's, it's amazing the response from them. And, uh, anytime we have a call for an issue, they're very responsive on it. We have a great supervisor in house that I can't say enough about that. You know, I meet with uh, twice a week and, you know, we consistently are making sure that this operation is working well and they're, they're part of our family now and it reflects, I believe, in the service. Um, just to give you an example, you know, we, we had some folks that were concerned about this to begin with, but uh, I, I had a, I, I won't mention any names or locations, but I had a folk, somebody approach me who was not very happy with the change, but uh, this person came up to me and stated how she was skeptical skepti skeptical at first, but sorry, um, but she actually had to use a lot, utilize the service and was thoroughly impressed and couldn't say enough about it. And like I said, we, we really own this ambulance, the fire, you know, I'm responsible and in charge of it while it's in our station. And I can tell you that our oversight is is daily on it to make sure that our townsfolk are getting in the, you know, the best care possible. So are we doing more than one ambulance sometimes? Because I know you have the one, but it seems like we've been very busy, almost like, are you using the second one as well? Yes, that's actually why they, they moved that. Um, so basically from, it's normally 7 a.m. 
uh, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. They actually will stage that Med 2. It's called Hadley Med 2 uh, at the bridge in there. They have a uh, that building over there. Um, it's a substation for them that will, it uh, supports Holyoke, but it also supports us. And yes, we, we, we have seen a pretty substantial increase in the past, you know, couple of years with the second and actually third calls coming in all at the same time. So that we're actually um, utilizing that med to pretty consistently. And then also calling in for mutual aid resources. Uh, I can tell you this, you know, this past year we had a, or, you know, the mid to end of 2019, there were no ambulances available. We had our med one, med two, uh, Northampton had nothing available. Amherst had nothing available. We were calling uh, South County ambulance, which is part of our mutual aid agreement uh, to come down to handle a car accident that we had on river drive. And, um, there's, it's, it's insane how many calls some, it, it, when it rains, it pours. Um, there are times when it can be quiet, but I'll tell you, there's days where we, our heads are spinning off. And that's why, that's the other reason I'm telling you why it's so important that our day staff, our day firefighter EMTs are responding because there's times where they are the primary care providers until an ambulance can get there. And, you know, our, I can, I'm so proud of our guys because we have had saves. Uh, you know, we've had instances where our call force folks are there along with PD providing CPR and, and early defibrillation, waiting for an ambulance to get there. And it's working really well. And I really would not change this model. Um, it, it's, it's really, it's a home run. Plus you have local folks that are, you know, they're able to communicate with, um, the residents, you know, they're comfortable with them. They know them. Some of them know them from when they were kids. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for them to actually, uh, you know, communicate with them and make them feel, feel comfortable. I get lots of thank you notes in from folks, um, thanking us for this. So I think it's a great system. Yeah. The hours that the guys are doing, is that counting towards, um, you know, just because I know that you had to have before you, you know, you, you talked about down the road, would we be able to pick up some of the basic stuff? And so, but you have to have so many hours. Does all the hours you're doing count? As far as what could you, I'm sorry, I don't. Like, um, didn't you have to, before you can say that you could do the BLS, you had to have so many hours in. Actually, that's if um, we could start a BLS ambulance. Uh, we have the paperwork, you know, that's all set. Uh, we could actually start our BLS system tomorrow if we had an ambulance available. But if you wanted to move an A to an ALS or paramedic level, you have to have a minimum of one year under your belt for that. Um, I don't, I'm not looking at that model yet because we have action uh, in our, in our building. I'm just looking to try and support our budget and um, looking at a model of having a, you know, a second BLS bus so that our Hadley fire department ambulance would actually take the place of the Hadley Med 2 ambulance. So that revenue would be coming into us as well to support our, our system. Are you looking to put it down at the, um, would you be putting any, any ambulance down at the North Hadley? Uh, potentially that could be a site. I mean, the station is, was built out for future as a future resource right now. It's not going to be manned, but there would be the ability to put uh, a crew up in there. Um, if it can't, if, if we, you know, in the five-year plan, if we decided to actually move an ambulance in there and staff a second ambulance for specific hours, I think that could happen. I mean, ultimately down the road, would it be great to have a paramedic level Hadley ambulance service? I think, yes. Um, I don't know when that will happen, but uh, we're, you know, we're, we're taking baby steps right now to make sure that all our ducks in a row and we're, we're attempting to not uh, kill our budget if possible, but you can just see that the increase in calls for service are, they're not, they're not getting any less. Um, and, you know, we're still trying to keep up on inspections and the never ending, uh, there's, there's just, I mean, we're, we're so inundated with inspections and everything, which we're really far behind on now because we can't, we can't get out to half the spaces, but we're supposed to be starting our April inspections for all the uh, restaurants and everything. And I, I don't know if that's going to happen right now. Um, just, just because we're trying to limit exposure. 
So um, we'll see where that goes. Okay. Did you want to go over the communications at all for the, um, the dispatch? I think Mike presented the communications budget and Mike is, uh, he's, that's true. Uh, he's I think I think he presented that to you already. And I a hundred percent agree with whatever, whatever he presented. Uh, we've had multiple conversations and I think he's got the, the pulse of that department uh, more than I do. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Mike? No, um, no questions. No, uh, thank you very much and uh, for the explanations too. Anytime, we appreciate your support. Whatever, whatever comes, comes. <laughs> so, I, I understand okay. it's going to be a tough. It may be a tough year, and whatever, whatever happens, we're here. To, we'll just keep working hard. All right, well, Mike. Does uh, does um the does the action have you know how are they seeing with this virus going on? I mean, it, do they have a lot of people? Um, you know, if they lose out on a lot of their staff, do they have a plan or? Yes, uh, the president has a plan. Um, they they have resources. So they have, like you said, they have Pittsfield, they have other services. So basically what the latest, uh, there's been a lot of um, stuff coming down from the hospitals, from the state uh, office of emergency medicine, trying to um, modify requirements that are quite strict in a normal instance but you know there's been some, some some big changes as far as you know first responders can now drive a fire uh, an ambulance rather than it just being a emergency medical technician um just mm -hmm. it used to be you, you had to have two an emt and a paramedic go into the house to evaluate the patient they're allowing one to go in now um so it's, you know, they're allowed to actually evaluate the patient to see if there's actually a need to transport. Um, you know, we're, we, it's in our, sit, in our daily sit rep on the, the Hadley site for folks. If they can go there and take a look at that sit rep, it's extremely important for us. If you have symptoms of this, rather than calling 911, unless you have a medical emergency with this, it's important that you reach out to your primary care doctor because we, it's really hard for us to, you know, to bring all these folks to the hospital. The hospitals are inundated right now, and um, it's 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 a challenge. So again, we are doing daily uh, temperature readings of all of our staff, including Action. We, you know, everybody gets a temp check first thing in the morning uh, before they start their shift as they enter the building, and questions are asked. Um, and then it's if we have really strong uh, if we are responding to somebody with flu-like symptoms, what they have to dress up in, and then decon measures, uh, decontamination measures for the ambulance and the staff, uh, you know, getting out of those clothes, getting them into the laundry, uh, making sure that they have coveralls and, um, and gloves and eye protection and N95 masks. And if you don't mind, I would like to say thank you. We've had a lot of Hadley residents that have been dropping off extra stuff for us at the station. And we really, really appreciate it. The, the state, obviously, we haven't been able to order. Uh, the, there's nothing out there right now. I know there's resources that are starting to catch up, but just the town's folks uh, with providing gloves and extra N95 masks that they've had has really kind of filled that void for us. And it's amazing how uh, folks have been stepping up and we have, we have a great community and I'm really proud to be a part of it. Um, and I'm truly saying that from the heart. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with uh, Council on Aging. As you heard, we're starting a meal delivery tomorrow and we have uh, some of our junior firefighters are gonna be going out shopping. I think we have, we have quite the list and we're doing the, the test phase tomorrow to see how it works. And then we'll be bringing volunteers in if this actually works. Um, we're going to be providing uh, a pair of gloves to each of the folks that receive this with directions on how they should handle the food that we're delivering to them. Um, and they can keep those gloves, gloves to use for future uh, deliveries so that they understand that they might want to you know, we're obviously we're going to be wearing gloves as we pull this stuff off the shelves, but I don't know where it's been. So 
every chance we have with uh, with seniors and folks with compromised immune systems to uh, be be cautious with uh, touching things that are coming into their home and making sure that they you know they wipe them down or or provide perfect protection to themselves and wash their hands well. Uh, those are all things that we're working on uh, to to try and keep our, our community you know safe and, and healthy. So yeah. we're looking forward to tomorrow, see how it works. That's great. Thanks for everything that you're doing there and, and, and what you do with the schools all the time with all the sports. So um, you're definitely out in the community and the community sees that. So that thanks for that. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess uh, that would be it for tonight. Uh, does anybody have anything? Maybe would anyone else like to add anything or at this time? A couple of things, if I may. Sure. Sorry, I'm uh, bro broken up there a little bit, but um, yeah, so the uh, reserve fund transfer request, uh, I gave you a heads up about it last time. Um, this is for $9,800 for professional services to recruit a new town administrator. Uh, you received that by email today from me, the documents. Yep, we have it. I have it anyways. Maybe you're talking. Okay, so I, I have we have the uh, request and this request for ninety eight hundred dollars. This is for a service uh, in in search for the town administrator. Um, and you're looking for it to come out of the finance committee to the uh, select board for payment. Is that correct, David? Yes, it is. Now, I, I know the times are tough and, and, and things, but I think I, I do think this is important because we do want to hire. We, this is a, a, um, a company that we, we really want to get the, you know, this is an important job. And we want to get the best person we can for our future. So my thinking is um, this is something we might want to to look at doing. To, to, can I get any other feedback? I agree. I definitely agree. OK. Yeah, I, I, I would support this. Um, I also am concerned that our HR person, you know, is going to be deployed. I think we're going to need somebody just on this task alone. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so do I have a motion uh, to... I'll make, yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the... You need this read out properly? To approve no. the $9,800 for the search, professional search for a Newtown administrator, consultant. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, David, Thank so you just need me to sign this or no? Uh, yes, if you could sign it and scan it to me, that'd be great. Uh, we'll, we'll practice social distancing by documents. Uh, actually, maybe I don't need to sign it. Looks like the select board needs to sign it or maybe on the bottom on bottom of the first page okay i might not if have you, printed them all i'll do it i will um, i have it at work i will print it and then sign it and get to you tomorrow thank you very much so um uh, I, I just received today the uh, cpa articles i haven't uh, incorporated them into the warrant yet so I'll do that as soon as I do that. I'll get you uh, the latest and greatest for the annual time meeting warrant. The select board are going to be meeting tomorrow night, and they're going to be talking about two things. One, they are going to uh, defer the annual town elections. It was originally scheduled for second Tuesday in April, and they've now uh, moved that to the second Tuesday in May. Uh, the school superintendent has asked us to move it again to May 16th, which is a Saturday. And that means that if schools are open, we don't have to 
worry about um, uh, bringing po uh, people in to the school um, that may be symptomatic or asymptomatic for COVID-19. It's just a way of uh, reducing the risk for that uh, election. Um, the other thing they're gonna start talking about is uh, deferring the annual town meeting. Annual town meeting is currently scheduled for May 7th and the select board can on their own change the date to as late as June 30th. There is legislation pending in the state house. It's supposedly fast track, but they've been working on it for 13 days or so at this point. <laughs> to give towns uh, the ability to uh, defer the town meeting to a time after Ju uh, July 1st. So um, there's a million pieces of financial management that have to go along with that certification of free cash, um, stabilization, uh, revolving funds, uh, uh, debt and interest payments, lump sum payments by the, um, by the treasurer in the first uh, couple of days of the fiscal year. Lots of things to think about. So as soon as that legislation is finalized, I will study it, I will get you the information. But I think that the Finance Committee and the Select Board should meet on April 15th to um, talk about these and other issues, as well as the revised revenue budget that I'm going to have to be working on in the next couple of days. Uh, I welcome any input you may have, any ideas as to what you think may be happening in the next 100 days. I th believe we're still on the upslope here in the Commonwealth for COVID-19 transmission and, and contagion. Um, I'm thinking more in terms of 100 days before anything settles back to normal. Um, it's going to impact our revenues, that's for sure. Uh, if anybody's got a better idea as to what this is going to look like over the next six months, I'm very interested in hearing it. Uh, as soon as I get you, as soon as I'm able to work out the revenue stream, I will then start making further adjustments to the budget at the expense side in order to bring it back into balance. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty predictable that this is going to be an ugly budget. Uh, Amy and I had a conversation earlier today about what that may look like. Um, I'm hoping, Amy, it's not as grim as you and I were talking about, but uh, we're going to have to make some difficult decisions in order to have a balanced budget for FY21. Uh, unprecedented times. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, but we've had uh, challenges in the past. We made it through the Great Recession with, uh, without too much difficulty, uh, making wise decisions, managing our money, uh, making decisions about reserves. Uh, we'll get through this time as well. Yes. Um, I, so I don't, I think we got through most of them. Um, where is Hadley Media? I don't remember seeing which one were they supposed were they supposed to be in one of our meetings or do we have another one set? They're, they're supposed to be for tonight. The Hadley Media is uh, here. Do you, um, Amy, you said that you'd had a conversation with Drew. Well, I thought Drew was mentioning he might not, he, he was all set, didn't have anything to add and if he didn't have to come, but if he has, I'd rather if he's available and he's here, that would be great because I'd rather him speak to his, um, if he's, I would like to hear him speak if he, if he's, yeah. if he can. David Moskin is on this uh, meeting as well. He's the chair of the oversight committee. Um, not to put you on the spot, David, uh, maybe we need to have uh, one more meeting of the finance committee in order to talk about the budget. John, you there? Sorry, David, this, this is David. Uh, whatever you think is best, David. Okay. Tell you what, why don't we have a conversation with Drew and uh, then Amy, we'll see if we can uh, 
get back to uh, finance committee about the budget for uh, Hadley Media. That, that'd be good because I do want to review the Hadley Media because I when, at first when I talked to Drew before, um, it sounded like there wasn't any changes, but when I looked at his uh, budget, there was quite a few, there was some big changes. So I wanted to um, have, you know, review those. Um, sure. so okay. I'll set it up. Great. Thank you. But also, David, if you could, um, myself and I think some of the others here, we would like to have a nice conversation and sit down and go over, you know, um, with you um, more of the line items. So when we, to get really into each now that we've heard from every department and yeah. we can hear what they wanted. Now I think we can dig into each one a little bit more and makes and, and put some good opinions in there and why we think they should be increased, decreased or what it is. Absolutely. Happy to work with you. Great. And, and also if we could uh, request as far as I'm not including the, sal the salaries, I would like to see if they were um, increases due to hours or increases due to s additional staff or something changes is one thing. Then I would like to discuss that if, you know, when we're going over each item. I think that really pertains to us. But if it's just an increase that has to do with a step or an increase that has to do with the COLA, I really think I'd like to pass that back to HR, back to you, back to the select board um, to, so that way everyone feels like they, you know, they have a fair um, say or whatever. I don't want to get involved in who's um, deserves what, because I, I'm not, we're not familiar with um, where they are. Plus we don't have the study in front of us to see if it's accurate or not. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Um, do I have anybody else that would like to say last few words? I have one last question if uh, everybody else is all set. Yeah. David, if we have ideas for you on COVID, is that direct email to you or how do you want to be communicated with? Uh, is, Ed, is that you? Uh, this is Dylan. Dylan Mans. Oh, hi, Dylan. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, if you have qu uh, questions, uh, by all means, uh, send them my way, and I'll, I'll compile them, respond to them, debate them. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Dylan, I mentioned to David that it is a good time, and maybe that's I, I about, you know, if we are doing something, maybe we want to look at the borrowing because and um, when we're looking at the budget next time, because at some point, you know, with with the rates being low and, and with people needing work, it might be a good time for us to borrow on some of this. Yeah, yeah I agree. Something to look into. Okay. How's everybody doing? How's everybody feeling? Feeling great. I'm doing great. All right. Be well, be safe, everybody. Yes. So, um, you too. If we don't have anything else to add um, at this point. motion, motion <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you all. Amy, thank you very much. Thank you, David.